Welcome back to another episode of Podward State. I'm your host, Sam Brungo. I'm Grace Cunningham. We also have our associate producer, Will Pegler, here today. Will, how are you? How's it going, guys? Thanks again for having me. Of course. Always a pleasure to have you on. On this episode, we have former Penn State College of Calm alumni, also played for the Lady Lions, works now for ESPN, Lisa Salters. Guys, what do you think about Lisa? Very cool to talk to her. I liked her stories. She almost drove the Wienermobile, which I thought was very cool. Yeah, it was great. She had some uh, some cool stories about her days at Penn State and kind of took us through her uh, career arc all the way up to you know where she's working now, doing Monday Night Football, doing big time um, NBA games as a sideline reporter. Really, really cool interview. Without further ado, here's our conversation with Lisa Salters. Joining us now, we have ESPN personality and Penn State Lady Lions and College of Calm alumni, Lisa Salters. Lisa, welcome to the show. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me, you guys. So first off, we just want to start off with your journey to Penn State. So why why did you choose Penn State to start out with and what really brought you here? Well, I'm from uh, outside of Philadelphia. I'm from King of Prussia. Uh, so Penn State is uh, just a three hour drive away. Um, it's been a long time ago, but I, I think I remember uh, it was between UVA, uh, Penn State, Temple. Um, and just uh, after my visit, I just really loved the campus and uh, decided that I wanted to, to be in any line. So when you first came to Penn State, did you know that you wanted to pursue a career in journalism or was that something you discovered later? No, I. Uh, I knew that I wanted to be a journalist. I didn't really know what. I, I thought like a news anchor uh, or a reporter. Um, but I also knew that I didn't know all that goes into uh, you know, journalism. So um, I, I had aspired to be, I'm, like I said, I'm from outside of Philadelphia and there was a, a, a news anchor uh, on the air there at Channel 6, WPBI. Her name is uh, Lisa thomas Laurie. And uh, I was a big fan of hers. And, um, you know, I just thought like, there's someone who looks like me and that looks pretty cool. And I'd like to do what, what she does. So initially I kind of was leaning towards, I wanted to be a, you know, an anchor. Um, but um, in, a, in a broader sense, I just knew that I wanted to be a journalist like her. While you were at Penn State, what did you, did you do anything that furthered your interest in the field, like any clubs or anything like that? Well, I played basketball, so that made it tough. Like, so I couldn't write for the collegian. Uh, or do things like that. Um, but I was able to have internships in the summer and uh, I worked with Jerry Fisher, um, did some things with him. He likes to say that he gave me my start, which he did, I guess. Um, so uh, I really would have would have liked to have written for the Collegian, but I just, you know, because of my basketball commitments, I wasn't able to do that. Yeah, you just mentioned it. So um, obviously playing for the Lady Lions for a few years, what do you, uh, what do you recall from those days? Um, and what, do you have any, you know, strong memories that stand out from your days of playing for um, Penn State women's basketball? A lot of fun. Um, a lot of hard work. You know, being a, a student athlete is uh, a lot like having a job and going to school at the same time. Um, you know, it's a it's a very real uh, commitment that you have to make uh, to a team, whatever your sport, whatever sport you're, you're participating in. Um, I remember, you know, my teammates, uh, it's not that I don't really remember the games all that much. I just remember, you know, the relationships, my teammates, my coaches, um, you know, come, some of the places that we traveled to, that kind of thing. But I also wasn't very good. So I, it wasn't like I was an elite athlete and didn't get much playing time at all. So for me, it was all about kind of my teammates. Um, for other people on the team, like who were really good, I would imagine they would see it differently. Like they would think about the competition and, and the close games and the tough losses, things like that. I don't really remember uh, the X's and O's, uh, but that's kind of how I am now um, in, in my job is that I don't really remember the games that much. Like they're, you know, I've had three games in the last week and, uh, you know, I couldn't tell you the final score of any of them. Um, I, you know, I'm in it when it's happening and then when it's over, it's done. But I can, you know, tell you about every conversation that I had with every player or every coach uh, or my colleagues who called the game. Um, so uh, as far as my Penn State experience playing basketball, I mean, it was great. I had a lot of fun. Um, and what I enjoy the most is that I still, you know, have teammates that I occasionally, you know, can hit up and, and find out what's going on with them. And uh, you know, those are the things that I remember. So in 2018, you were honored as Penn State 
homecoming grand marshal. What was it like to be recognized as a um, alumni of Penn State that really has been influential? Well, it was it was really cool. Um, just you know to be sitting up there uh, during the parade and and then at, at halftime of the game, um, you know I I remember um, them playing the Monday Night Football theme music when I when they introduced me and that that was really cool. I thought I didn't know that they were going to do that. Um, but I'd say even more so than that, um, it was being asked to be the, uh, the uh, uh, commencement speaker at graduation uh, in 2016, I believe it was. Um, like that just was so um, humbling. Uh, and you hear people say that a lot, but you know, it was such an honor to even be asked to do it. Um, because I remember, you know, when I was 22 and graduating, I could not tell you who my commencement speaker was. I uh, don't remember. And I really wanted to kind of say something that was impactful, um, that just something, one little thing that, the, you know, students who were heading off into their, the rest of their lives, something that they could take with them. Uh, so I took it very seriously. Um, but to be asked to do it, you know, when I was driving back up to campus, I thought, who would have thought you know, all those years ago when I drove away uh, for that last time as a student that, you know, I'd be invited back to come back as a commencement speaker. Um, so when I thought about it like that, I just thought, wow, one, I'm really old. Uh, and two, uh, you know, I must have must have done something right in those 30 years in between. So after your time at Penn State, uh, what was the job search like coming out of college and how did you kind of launch your career? I started uh, at uh, WBAL TV in Baltimore. Uh, you know, I was like everybody else in journalism, um, you know, all your friends in business and, um, you know, in poli sci and everything else, they all have like three and four jobs lined up and they get to pick and choose when they're, you know, when they're graduating. But for us in journalism, it's not like that. You can't just like say, oh, I'm going to go start at this radio station or this TV station. It, it's just, you know, jobs are, are too uh, few and far between. So, you know, I was kind of panicking this time, like in March, April. Uh, of my senior year, not knowing what I was going to do. And, um, you know, I, I had in my back pocket, uh, I was going to drive the Oscar Mayer Wiener mobile um, that they had, uh, did they still do that on campus? They recruit for that. Um, Cause I got it. I went through this intense interview process and I remember them calling me and I remember telling my parents and they were like, what are we going to tell our friends that you're doing? Like that you're driving a hot dog. Like that is ridiculous. So, uh, and you know, the job, didn't pay. It wasn't, it wasn't like it paid poorly. It was a pretty good, pretty good job. And I figured I could see the country, drive around, whatever. Um, but uh, at the 11th hour, uh, WBAL television in Baltimore, um, they offered me kind of like a, a reporter trainee position. Um, they had seen some of the stuff I'd done and they, they knew that I wasn't ready to be on, you know, uh, on local television. Um, at 22, they knew that I was raw, but they also saw something in me that I, I suppose that they thought that they could, that they could work with. So they kind of started a reporter trainee program. I made $13,500 to start. I would have made more money driving the hot dog. Um, but, uh, but it was the best decision that I, uh, that I could have made and because it was in my field. It was in, I just, you know, they tell you all the time in journalism, just get in the door. And that is absolutely true. Whatever position they want to put you in, just get in the door. You can prove yourself once you get there. Uh, and that's what I did. Like within nine months, I was, uh, I was on the air in Baltimore as a full-time, as a full-time reporter. They definitely do still recruit because I, I rode in the peanut mobile like last month for a nice. big story. Nice. And, and for whatever reason, like Penn State is like their spot to go to, to, to yeah, get people. The Wienermobile, the, the hot dog um, recruits here and the Nutmobile recruits at like other schools, but the Nutmobile came here also. So um, after after your time um, in Baltimore, after your, after your first job, you, you spent some time in L.A. with ABC. Um, you covered some really high profile events such as the O.J. Simpson trials. Um, how did kind of moments like that help you grow? Um, as a reporter, even before getting ESPN, how did, you know, covering kind of like internationally known moments really help you help you develop? You know, it was uh, immensely helpful. Um, all of my 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 training, especially even in back in Baltimore as a reporter trainee and as a young cub reporter, um, you know, I was 22 to 28 when I was in Baltimore in local television 
And I did everything. I, you know, I asked to take all the shifts that the veterans didn't want to take. I'll work the weekend. I'll work at night. Uh, and it just gave me so much experience. Um, you know, again, I just got in the door and then just decided I was going to do anything and everything that they asked me to do. Um, so uh, I was horrible at live television at first. My first live shot, someone sent me a copy of it. It's just absolutely awful, just terrible. <laughs> and, um, you know, but it started all started from there. Then when I went to ABC and I was covering these big stories, the O.J. Simpson trials, I did that for two years of my life doing 10 to 20 live shots every single day for two years. So, you know, people ask me now if I get nervous being in front of a camera, like, no, <laughs> that's what I did. I did thousands of live shots in the five years that I was at ABC, probably thousands just in those two years uh, at, uh, you know, covering the OJ Simpson trial. So, you know, now, like all of that, I, you know, I can look back on it now and see that it was all just kind of, um, it laid a foundation for me to, to do what I do now, which is uh, um, to be on the sidelines for, for, for Monday Night Football and for, uh, for uh, ESPN with our, NBA, with our NBA coverage. Um, but, you know, that's just, a, you know, that's just the, the large part of what I do, but what I enjoy most uh, or what I like most about my gig is that I get to do that sidelines, but I also get to do E60 and tell long, longer form stories. Um, so I, I feel like I get a little bit of everything. I get to exercise all my muscles so that, uh, none of them atrophy. So you mentioned, uh, getting your job at ESPN. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Like how it got to that point and how you ended up there? Yeah. So I was at ABC news, uh, the network, and I was based in, um, based in LA and, um, you know, one of my bosses there, his father was a boss at ESPN in Connecticut. And ABC and ESPN are both owned by uh, Disney. So, um, you know, we're both sister companies of the larger parent company, the Walt Disney Company. So, you know, every day I'd go into work and my boss would say, my father wants to recruit you to come work for ESPN. ESPN, are you interested? And for two years, I kept saying no. Like, why would I leave network news, uh, you know, when you're a journalist, you guys know that, you know, you're, the dream is to be at the network by the time you're 30. So I was 28. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I had done it. I was 28 years old and I was at the network. And at this time, I guess I was like 33, 32. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to like ever leave network TV. No, no way I'm going to leave ABC news to go to ESPN. You know, at that time, back then, uh, you know, things are, you know, times are different now, but back then ESPN was not thought of as this, you know, beacon of journalism, you know, um, it was just a sports network. And so my colleagues and I kind of looked at it that way. Is this, you know, this sports network? Um, but, you know, eventually after two years of them asking, finally, I said, okay, I'll give it, I'll give it a, a shot with the understanding that if I didn't like it, I could just go back to the other part of the company, which was ABC. So it was, you know, really just a lateral move within, within the company. And uh, I decided to make the move because I, I realized that I wasn't all that happy at ABC. Um, you know, you have, you know, dozens and dozens of correspondents for 22 minutes of airtime every day on World News Tonight and, you know, and Good Morning America. And that was really it. Um, so there was no cable. Uh, so there was no 24 hour news cycle. Um, at, you know, when I was there, ABC was going to start a 24 hour news, but then they didn't. Um, and so, you know, I realized like how I'm going to be going to work every day, kind of sitting around, not really doing a whole lot and getting paid, but not really doing a whole lot. And so I decided, and I wasn't really all that happy doing it because I was, you know, covering stories like uh, the crash of TWA flight 800, the Oklahoma city bombing, you know, stories that, you know, kind of downers. <laughs> and so um, I decided to like, you know what, I'm going to go give this sports thing a try. And, uh, see if it works out. And fortunately, it kind of did. So eventually you worked your way up to be a sideline reporter for a college football Saturday night football on ABC. And there's a clip of you somewhere covering the whiteout. What was that like for you as a Penn Stater? Uh, it was really cool. I think I was in the, in the student section with the fans. Um, it was just, it was really cool. Um, 
some of my, you know, I did a lot of Penn State games um, during the six years that I did college football. And, you know, I remember it was just, uh, it was always just a good feeling to go, to go back. I remember one time uh, during halftime, you know, everything's kind of quiet and I was, you know, kind of walking the sidelines. I don't know where I was headed, uh, but there were no, no players or coaches on the field. I think maybe I was headed back to the, you know, to the, uh, to the locker room area to wait for a coach or something like that. And just out of nowhere, I just hear this loud voice, Hey, Lisa. And I'm thinking, geez, like what, like I'm used to people kind of yelling down, like, hi, Lisa, hi, Lisa, that kind of thing. And, but this woman's voice was so loud. Hey, Lisa. And I look up like what? <laughs> and she just said, welcome home. And I just made me feel so good. And I was like, thank you. Like, thank, I thought I was going to like cry right there on the field, <laughs> but I was like, you know, thank you so much. Um, so it, you know, even now it's, it's, um, it's just a pleasure to, to go back and to have people be proud of you. Like the commencement speech, like, uh, being the grand marshal, just going back and knowing that people, um, remember you, you know, remember that you were there and that they, you know, like the alma mater says that, you know, uh, you know, that I did something that makes them feel proud, um, that, uh, it's a good feeling. So you thought about it a little bit, remembering kind of moments like that, rather than the, the X's and the O's of the game. Um, do you have any other, you know, environment, like college football environments that you got to go to that stand out besides Penn State? I know, obviously, we're all biased. Penn State, <laughs> got to be the best you've been to. But no, um, are there are there any others that, that stand out to you that you've been to? Jeez, I mean, I mean, it's nice to go home to Penn State. But I mean, I've been to... I've been to China. I've been to Africa a few times. I've been to... Uh, Nagano, the Olympics in Japan. I covered the Olympics in um, Torino. Um, I've been to a lot of really cool places. Uh, I, I spent six weeks in Korea doing the World Cup in 2002. Um, so this job, uh, this thing called journalism has taken me really all over the world. Um, I spent, you know, six weeks in, or sorry, two weeks in Kuwait uh, with ESPN um working so which is good because I love to travel um so I've been I've just been to places and it's not all that glamorous either like I you know I was in China just uh two years ago and it was not all that glamorous at all but it, you know I always did kind of want to go to China um but you know I didn't really like the food you know the people there were there's so many people um but uh yeah, I mean, it's a if you want to if you want to see the world, be a journalist. <laughs> That's a good way to help you uh, see the world. Over the past couple of years, specifically summer 2020, there's been this Black Lives Matter movement. What's it been like for you as a journalist to cover that in the world of sports? Because it really has taken on like kind of a life of its own just in sports. And they uh, turned out to be really influential. It's been inspiring. And um and, and uplifting to see the way that athletes have used their platforms over the last year, year and a half. Not that they hadn't before, but there seemed to be, they seem to be galvanized uh, and they seem to, you know, be unified in a way unlike they ever had been before in the past. And so one of the reasons that I wanted to go to the NBA bubble last, last summer um, because I knew it was going to be a huge commitment once you're, I mean, once you're in, you're in, you, there's no coming in and out. You just had to be there. And, you know, I have a, you know, a child, I didn't necessarily want to be away from my child for as long as I was, it ended up being six weeks. Um, the, the main reason that I wanted to go was because I knew one, I recognized the, the historic significance of the moment. Uh, and two, uh, I knew that those players had something to say and I wanted to help them say it. Uh, I knew that they were unified like no other time before. And I knew that they were, they were ready to seize this moment, not because of basketball, uh, that you know, every one of them to a man said that we didn't come back here, you know, with the focus being on basketball, we came back here uh, to, to, to raise our voices and to use this unique platform that, that we have. And so that was, uh, you know, I wanted to be a part of that. Um, I wanted to be a part of that, to have an up close uh, and personal seat to watch them do whatever it was that they were going to do. 
And, um, you know, I, I knew it was, again, I knew it was going to be historic and I wanted to, uh, to be able to see that history as it unfolded. So you've also worked the sideline for Monday Night Football and numerous NBA games, as you just mentioned. So what are some of the challenges that come with working such fast-paced events? You know, the biggest challenge is now in this world of social media is that, you know, you can't really fail because when you fail, if you fail now, you're doing so very publicly and you're instantly criticized. It's not like the game is over and someone goes back and critiques the game. Like you make a mistake now and it's you're trending on Twitter like uh, at, right as soon as you do it. So that's not, that's never a good feeling. Um, so you just, you just have to kind of, you know, as, as Peyton Manning would, would say, I remember Peyton Manning told me once, he's just like, trust your preparation. Um, and so it's the same thing that, that I do. Um, I was asking him if he was nervous, you know, when he first got to the Broncos after having been let go by the Colts and had, having his neck surgery and all, and all of that. And I was starting, at Monday Night Football. And I said, I'm starting a new job too. And uh, I was telling him that I was a little nervous and he was like, you know, me too, a little bit. He's like, but, you know, trust your preparation. And so, you know, that's the, that's the challenge, I guess, of any job where you know that if you don't do well, uh, you're going to fail very publicly. Um, but, uh, you know, I try to just prepare like every game is the Super Bowl, and uh, I trust that preparation. One other thing we wanted to ask you about, um, your cousin, former Pitt running back star Tony Dorsett. Just kind of curious how that, that rivalry has played out in your family, obviously also with the, the 2016 game. That was um, kind of like a legendary game, and that was the last time Pitt uh, beat Penn State. Just wondering how that rivalry has played out and uh, if you guys go back and forth on that at all. Um, we do. Uh, I remember when I was at Penn State, I – sent Tony a, um, a Penn State golf shirt. And he told me he threw it out. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like I was a, a struggling college kid. I, I paid good money for that. And he's like, I'm not wearing any. He's like, I wrote the kit. I'm not wearing anything that says Penn State on it. Um, so now we, we laugh about that. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of older and, and, and wiser and, and Tony's just old. I think he had knee surgery this week. Actually, he's doing all right. Um, but uh, a knee replacement, a knee replacement. So I'll tease him about that. Um, but uh, yeah, we would have our, he would tell his, his Joe Paterno stories. And, um, you know, it's, it's just kind of cool to hear someone who played talk about, you know, being recruited by Penn State and why he went to Pitt and that kind of thing. So we tease a little bit about the Pitt Penn State rivalry, but uh, he knows blue and white is really where it's at. Throughout your career, you've had a chance, obviously, to meet a lot of really cool people. What were some of the coolest interactions? You mentioned Peyton Manning earlier, but like some of the coolest interactions that you've had um, through working your jobs? I see some of the most memorable, most memorable interviews that I've done are people that you wouldn't know. Um, uh, just people who just had really unique stories to tell. Um, I'm going to go play in a golf tournament um, this weekend, um, you know, with a mother and father who lost their son, uh, you know, 15 years ago. He was the, the mascot at North Carolina and uh, he was killed, you know, during the NCAA tournament, um, uh, you know, walking along the side of the road hit by hit by someone and his parents, you know, um, honored his wishes and had his organs donated and ended up saving, you know, countless uh, lives. And since then, they've started a foundation in their son, Jason Ray was his name. They started a foundation in his name and they have a, a yearly golf tournament. And so I'm going to play in that tournament on Monday. Um, but the Charlotte and Emmett Ray were are, are two of the most, um, uh, you know, thoughtful, kind uh, people that I've that I've met uh, in my job and, um, you know, the, the heartbreak and devastation that they still feel, I still feel for them, you know, all these years later, but, you know, you wouldn't know who they are. The, the transgendered athlete that I met a few years ago, Matt Dawkins, uh, taught me so much about um, being transgender and what's that, what that means, that, that complicated issue, what that means, what it's like. Um, I really kind of didn't want to have anything to do with it, didn't really care that much. 
um, didn't apply to me. So I was like, that's just weird. Um, but that kid, that 16 year old kid uh, taught me so much uh, about that issue and kind of opened my eyes and, and raised awareness for me um, about that. Um, but as far as like people that you might know, Michelle Obama, I got to meet Michelle Obama and get a photo with her um, a few years ago. It's been like seven years ago now. Um, Tiger Woods, um, you know, any athlete that you can think of, I've probably met him or her. Um, but uh, again, some of the most impactful, some of the people who've had the most impact on me or some of the stories that have had the biggest impact on me uh, are people um, or about people and about stories that you, you probably wouldn't recognize the names. Is there anyone specifically that's made you feel really starstruck or nervous or like can't believe that you're actually talking to them? Or is it just kind of part of the job? Um, hmm. I can't think of anybody because um, I see them so often. So if it's a football or basketball player, no, because I see them all the time. It would probably have to be like a celebrity, like a, a movie star or something like that. But I don't really get to see the, I mean, occasionally they're, they're at like courtside or at games, something like that. Um, but I don't, I don't tend to get starstruck because and, and all my friends are like, oh my God, you were, you know, Beyonce was at the game. Rihanna was right there at the game. And I'm like, and like, I'm, I'm working. I, I tend not to like, they don't really care about me. Like, why would I care about them? I hope they have great lives and I'm happy that they're successful and all that, but you know, their lives don't have anything to do with me. That's why I don't really understand the whole reality TV thing. Like, I don't get like why people get so caught up in other people's lives. It's like, I'm so, so busy trying to deal with my own life that I really could care less what's going on in Kim Kardashian's life. Um, but that's just me. Like, is there, like, who would you want to, who would you want to meet if there was somebody that you could meet? Who would you want to meet? And I'll see if I put that up. I have no idea. That's a loaded question. Oh. Well, Fair point. <laughs> Sorry. Is there anybody? Uh, going, my, my freshman year here, um, we were at a tailgate and we happened to be at a tailgate kind of adjacent to one where Saquon Barkley was. So I went over and shook his hand and that was, that was one time I can definitely be in a lifelong Penn State fan and a New York Giants fan. That was one I can definitely say I was definitely starstruck. I don't know if you, I'm assuming you have met him. In yeah. Yeah. I can send you pictures, me and Saquon and take, took, I mean, cause also he knows I'm from Penn State. So we've run into each other, not just at games, but uh, up at Penn State when I was the grand marshal, he was on the sideline then, I believe. Um, so we took pictures then, and then after a game in New York, um, we took pictures because my nephew was also at the game. My nephew is a Penn Stater. Uh, he graduated a few years ago, and so all three of us took pictures. So, so um, just quickly, quickly going back to your time at Penn State um, as a student, do you have any sports moments either where you were a fan or maybe you were covering it that kind of stand out as like a favorite moment for you um, watching Penn State sports? Um, you know, I just remember them winning the national championship in what, 1986. That was pretty cool. Um, I remember them being in the Orange Bowl when I was playing um, women's basketball and we were down there for a tournament and we went to that game. They lost, but uh, we went to that game as a team. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, just... Uh, football, you know, just going to the games and the tailgating and, and all of that. Um, that's what I remember. Sports, those are my sports memories at Penn State. All right. Last thing we have here for you, advice for students, especially female students that are looking um, to get into uh, involved in sports media. What type of advice would you have for students like that? Uh, to work on your writing. Be a good writer. Um, you know, you can be taught how to perform in front of a camera. Um, but just, you know, work on writing. You've got to be able to tell a story uh, before you even get in front of the camera. So for any student, that's what the one thing that I would uh, really stress that you set yourself apart when you can write. Awesome, Lisa, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate this conversation. Sure, good luck to you guys. Well, there you have it, folks. There was our conversation with ESPN personality, Lisa Salters. Thanks again to Will Pegler for joining us. This has been another episode of Podward State. My name is Sam Brungo. I'm Grace Cunningham. Take it easy, y'all. Be safe.
Podward State is an Onward State produced podcast. Onward State is an independent, student run Penn State news site that works to generate honest conversation in the hopes of enriching the Penn State community. The show was founded by Matthew Ogden, Matthew Palizzi, and Mitchell Stewart in 2019. The show is hosted by Samuel Brunko, Matthew Palizzi, and Grace Cunningham. Executive producer Samuel Brunko. Associate producers George Mansberger and Will Peckler. Editor Samuel Brunko. Podward State releases episodes weekly and features discussions about all things Penn State, including sports, news, student life, and entertainment, which will be available on Spotify and YouTube. Don't leave.